second half of March 1943. Spring is coming, and as the Swedish saying goes, what is hidden in snow comes forth when it thaws. In 1943, it is what was hidden under occupation that is uncovered on liberation, or rather, occupation by the other side. This month, both sides in Europe find evidence of each other's atrocities. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olsen. In the first half of March 1943, the intensity of United Nations bombing of Germany increased. Acts of passive resistance thwarted Nazi plans to deport German Jews and Greek forced laborers. The famine in Hanan raged and rages on, while the food situation in Bengal, British India continued and continues to deteriorate. In occupied Yugoslavia, the communist partisans made a daring escape from the opposing Axis coalition. It became clear that total war for the Nazi leadership made victory or suicide for Germany. Some officers of the Wehrmacht lost hope for a soft end to the war and decided to get rid of German Führer Adolf Hitler by assassination. Eight days after that attempt failed, they try again. It's another failure that you can learn more about in Indy's coverage for that week. But the conspirators have not given up. To the contrary, it is allowing a core of clandestine, hardened opposition to grow. The leaders of this conspiracy have been looking to overthrow Hitler for many years. They have tried on several occasions from 1938 onwards. The attempts have always been thwarted by Hitler's ever-changing plans or faltering commitment among the conspirators. One main point has been the hope to convince even more Wehrmacht officers to force through a separate peace with the Western Allies. Now, the dire situation of the German forces, the official declaration by the UN allies that nothing else than unconditional surrender will end the war, and Hitler's firm and final rejection of unconditional surrender has united them again. The unofficial leader of the conspiracy is Kurt Freiherr von Hammerstein Eckwad and Ludwig Beck. Hammerstein is the only high military commander who has survived openly opposing Hitler already since 1934 and the night of the Long Knives Purge. Retired and despite his opposition, he was called back to service 10 days into the Polish offensive in 1939 as commander of Army Group A. But in protest of the behavior in Poland, he again retired after only 11 days. By that time, he had gathered around him. Franz Halder, at the time general and later chief of staff of the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, OKW. Ludwig Beck, who had been fired as chief of staff of the OKW after trying to convince Hitler to help him overthrow the other Nazis. Dr. Jalmar Schacht, Hitler's previous finance minister. Ernst von Weizsäcker, secretary of state at the German foreign office. Karl Gördler, finance man and previous mayor of Leipzig. Admiral Wilhelm Canares, head of the Abwehr, the German military intelligence office, and his deputy, Colonel Hans Oster. Except for Halda, who leaves the conspiracy in 1940, the others have continued a variety of opposition efforts throughout the years. After retirement, Hammerstein has continued to privately but openly and vocally criticize the Hitler regime, and has miraculously survived it possibly through his deep connections to the Wehrmacht officer corps, where he remains highly respected by both Nazis and non-Nazis, possibly because Hitler does not perceive this aging man as a threat. In March 1943, Hammerstein is on his deathbed with advanced stage 4 cancer. A longtime friend visits in February and notes in his diary, I am ashamed to have belonged in an army that witnessed and tolerated all the crimes, is Hammerstein's final conclusion. With all too slow but steady determination, that is what unites the conspirators. All of them, except Hammerstein and Oster, have to varying degree and for varying time aided and abetted Hitler's regime, despite being opposed to the virulent anti-Semitism and criminality inherent to National Socialism. As Hammerstein is dying, the new unofficial leader has become Beck, who is also the designated future chancellor when the coup has succeeded. Through Oster, a member of the resistance since 1935, the group has recruited more and more supporters further down in the Wehrmacht hierarchy, such as Generalmajor Hennig von Tresco, who is now the chief plotter and operative leader of the assassination attempts, and 
Colonel Rudolf Christoph Freiherr von Gerstorf, the voluntary suicide bomber who has just failed but survived his mission. Not only has he survived, but the conspiracy remains undiscovered and they continue to plot the next attempt on Hitler's life. Assassination attempts on Hitler is not the only thing that comes back in March. Now some past atrocities are uncovered. When the Red Army liberates Vyazma and the German POW transfer camp Dulag No. 184. They discover physical proof of German military atrocities. They find around 40 100 meter long mass graves, row after row of dead Red Army soldiers counting over 70,000 corpses. The camp records showed that only 4,500 died of war wounds. The rest were murdered by starvation. In the winter of 41-42, 300 POW were dying every day. But the Germans also uncover a mass grave now in late March. In the Katyn forest, they come upon the mass graves of 12,000 of the 25,700 victims of the Soviet massacre of Polish officers, politicians, businessmen, and landowners from three years ago, when Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were still partners in crime. Documents on the corpses quickly show that they were not alive after April 1940. The German Nazis have created numerous such graves across Poland and the rest of Europe as we know, but this one is clearly not theirs. In late 1939 and all of 1940, this region was under Soviet control. The German discoverers start forensically cataloging their discovery and prepare a report for the Nazi leadership in Berlin. There are other past crimes in Poland that are all on the minds of the German Nazis this month as well. Back on September 10, 1941, the German occupiers forbade Polish men under 28 and women under 25 to wed. This was a measure to reduce the future Polish-speaking population in Poland in preparation for full annexation of Poland after the war. The idea was that less young marriages would lead to less children. And for sure, marriages are down with up to 70% in some regions. But 18 months after the measures were introduced, the SS are astonished to discover that births are not down significantly. To their dismay, they conclude that young Polish couples have simply continued to make little babies as usual, but now out of wedlock. While this rather romantic form of resistance goes on, more and more are also taking up arms against the fascists. In Greece, the Elas militant resistance continued to put pressure on the Italian occupiers. After the battle earlier in the month at Fardicambos, the Italian garrison at Grevina is practically surrounded. An Italian expeditionary force secures a corridor to their trapped comrades, and they hastily evacuate, abandoning Gravena and a treasure trove of heavy armaments. On March 25, Greek Independence Day, Elas parades through Gravena as liberators of the second city in Greece, the first being Karditsa on March 12. In Belarus, the Soviet partisans' forces are rapidly growing. Following the German debacle at Stalingrad, collaborators serving in the German police have begun to switch side, when they are promised amnesty by the Soviets. But the German reprisals still continue to claim countless civilian lives. On March 22nd, about 250 men enter the village of Khatin, not to be confused with the Khatin forest. They are roughly 100 members of the German SS Sonderbataillon Dierlewanger and 150 to 160 members of the Schutzmannschaft Bataillon 118, led by German commander Erich Körner, but made up mostly of Ukrainian nationalists and former Soviet POWs. Some are veterans of the Babi Yar massacre, and except the POWs, all have joined voluntarily to carry out reprisals and mass murders against their own Soviet countrymen, euphemistically dubbed Aktionen in Belarus. At Khatin earlier that day, a German convoy was attacked by Soviet partisans. Nazi casualties included four officers of the Schutzmannschaft Bataillon 118, so they come to reap revenge. They burn the entire village and kill the inhabitants as they try to escape. In total, 149 people, including 75 children below the age of 17. Massacres like this occur on a regular basis. In the spring of 1943 alone, roughly 12,000 Belarusian women children and men are murdered in this way. The Nazi effort to murder anyone they consider Jewish is also meeting more and more resistance. 
In France, underground papers, both on the left and right, secular, Christian, and Jewish, have been warning Jews to escape since autumn last year. They've been calling for French non-Jewish civilians to aid their countrymen in peril. But mention of the Jewish genocide is gradually once again disappearing from public discourse by the French resistance. It's fear of an anti-Semitic backlash, as when Henri Frenet recommends the leader of the French resistance, Charles de Gaulle, to not become the man who brings back the Jews. Although it is our duty to eliminate any racial distinction, we must in practice take into account the attitude of the population, which has in effect changed in the last two years. The focus of the French resistance instead continues to be rallying people in opposition to the forced labor operations, a task that is, by the way, quite successful. The ranks of the resistance has swelled, but still, armed resistance hasn't grown much at all. You see, the United Nations allies have decided that France is not a military priority for 1943, and both funds and arms are only trickling in, despite repeated messages of how desperate the situation is to the leadership of the Free French in London. So both the resistance and the Jews are left to their own. As for warning the Jews, in March it is the Yiddish-language underground paper Un Savort that publishes another one. Do not wait at home for the Nazi bandits. Take every measure to conceal yourselves. In the first place, find safe haven for the children with the assistance of the French population standing with you. Secure your own safety. Join a patriotic combat organization to strike the bloodthirsty enemy. In the event that you are caught by the Nazi brutes, resist by every means. Barricade the doors. Call for help. Fight the police. What do you have to lose? Conversely, you may save your life. You must look for every means and everywhere for an escape. These warnings to the Jews have taken effect, and the Nazis are finding it harder and harder to find Jews in France to deport. And despite concerns about anti-Semitic sentiments, they are getting some help. Jewish children have been hidden in non-Jewish orphanages, families have gone into hiding in the countryside, and young Jews have joined the armed resistance. Meanwhile, the Dutch armed resistance carries out a big hit against the German occupier. Back in 1940, the Civil Occupation Administration of the Netherlands introduced a mandatory ID card for everyone over 15. The Ausweis includes a person's name, occupation, photo, and even fingerprint, and Jewish IDs include a big letter J. Soon after, the resistance started forging them for people who needed a fake identity for whatever reasons. Resistance member Gerrit van der Veen started the ID station, which will produce 80,000 fake IDs throughout the war. The only problem is that the Dutch government keeps meticulous details of its citizens in the civil registry office, so that fake IDs can be uncovered by cross-reference. On March 27, a group of men, led by Gerrit van der Veen and his friend Wilhelm Arondeus, attack the civil registry in Amsterdam. To avoid violent repercussions, they have decided that none shall be killed, so they sedate the guards with injections and enter the building. They open up the archives, pile them up, set them on fire, and detonate explosive charges as they leave. The fire brigade arrives quickly, but they have been infiltrated by the resistance and only contain the fire rudimentarily. Despite these efforts, only about 15% of the records are destroyed. The rest is rescued by members of the administration. Additionally, a number of the resistance operatives are apprehended by the SS Sicherheitsdienst, including Wilhelm Arondeus. But Gerrit van der Veen escapes to continue his work. Faced with growing resistance in Western Europe, the Gestapo increases the frequency of their searches and the brutality of their methods. In the Netherlands, the deportation of Jewish people is not hampered by the logistic problems elsewhere, but the amount of suspected Jews in hiding are thwarting the Nazi plans. So the Nazis start to place bounties on the heads of Jews. For every Jew, they award seven guilders fifty. In March 1943, a group of Dutch bounty hunters forms to hunt as many Jews as they can. They're led by Wilhelm Heinecke. There are 17 other core members, but in total the group counts about 50 people. The Heinecke column gathers clues, intimidates witnesses, and ultimately hands between eight and 9,000 Jews to the German authorities from now until October. They will end mostly in the extermination factory Sobibor and the hybrid death labor camp at Auschwitz. 
That's the same destination for a thousand other parts of Western and Southern Europeans, where the Holocaust has now begun. On the same day, the deportation of 4,000 Jews from the French transit camp Drancy begin. They are selected and herded into cattle wagons by German SS and French police. Joseph Dunitz is one of the victims on a transport that leaves on the 25th. He later testifies. We were told, and we indeed believed, that we were being sent off to work, that the Jews have to take part in the war effort and not wander about in the cities of France. They are not going to work in factories. These trains are going to Sobibor. In Auschwitz-Birkenau, the first Roma and Sinti arrived back in February. They are being housed in a separate section of the camp, the Sigoyna Lager. This is a family camp, and not all Roma and Sinti have been selected for gassing on arrival, but they live under horrendous circumstances, suffering from exhaustion, hunger, and disease. But many are also killed for a variety of reasons. On the 23rd, for example, a group of roughly 1,700 Roma and Sinti from Poland arrives. Some are said to be suffering from typhus, and the camp authorities send them all straight to the gas chambers. But the largest group arriving at the Nazi terror facilities in these two weeks are Greek. Before the war, roughly 70,000 to 80,000 Jews were living in Greece. They are made out of two distinct groups, the Romaniotes, whose regional presence goes back to antiquity. Their communities in large cities like Athens, Volos, and Ioannina are fully integrated in the modern Greek culture and language, making them practically indistinguishable from other Greeks. The other group are the roughly 53,000 Sephardic Jews who fled Spain in the 15th century. They live most in Salonika, have stuck to its distinct cultural heritage and language, and have suffered open anti-Semitic and sporadic violence already before the war. It is the latter group that the German Nazis somehow imagine pose a threat to the port city of Salonika from the get-go. The anti-Semitic nature of the war is less of a priority to the German, Allied, Italian, and Bulgarian occupiers, though. Still, in July 1942, around 10,000 of them were rounded up and sent to mines and infrastructure projects as forced laborers. Eventually, in January 1943, Adolf Eichmann, the logistics manager of the Holocaust, sent his second-in-command, Rolf Günther, to assess how to purge Greece of Jews. Together with Dieter Wislitzini and Alois Brunner, a company of German order police and local Greek police start cracking down on Salonika's Jews. They make the usual preparations. Jews are registered, forced to wear a yellow star, and register their possessions. The Jewish quarters in Salonika are fenced off, and on March 15th, the first of 19 transports leave the port. The first train, 2,800 Jews, are taken to Auschwitz-Birkenau, where 2,191 are murdered on arrival. But Jews in Bulgaria proper get a pass for now. As we have seen, the country has promised the Germans to deport 20,000 Jews to the German extermination factories. Most have already been murdered in occupied Macedonia and Trace. The remaining have been put in a makeshift transit camp in Skopje. On March 22nd, 2,338 of them are transported to the Treblinka extermination factory, where they are gassed on arrival. To fulfill the German quota, Jews in Bulgaria proper were to be included as well. Before that can happen, though, on March 17, the Bulgarian parliament refuses to deport its own Jews. Still, Bulgarian Jews continue to be imprisoned in camps and ghettos and continue to be used as forced laborers by their fellow countrymen. It is not savior, only a reprieve, but one that might save lives. Because... Although the wholesale slaughter of men, women, and children continues at a terrifying pace, there is change in the air. In the past three years, the Nazis and their allies have come down on Europe like an infestation of ravenous wolf packs, crazed by the scent of blood. Everywhere they went, they roamed free, barking, biting, and snarling at anyone in their way. In packs, they descended on the defenseless and armed alike, tearing at the flesh of humanity, devouring every last bit of decency in the world, leaving behind a trail of sorrow and desolation. Many were swept up in the frenzy and joined to feast on the blood of their neighbors. Many more, most, just cowered in fear, hoping, praying that they would not be the next victims. 
But now, when the world has seen that the Nazi wolves are not invulnerable, more and more have the courage to stand up against them, some with guns and bombs, some by acts of humanity to save their fellow human beings, others by simply defying the Nazi dreams of racial hegemony by making love and having a baby. Never forget. Thank you.